Good morning, everyone, and uh, it's good to see uh, a significantly full hall after last night's gala dinner. Uh, and I hope everyone had a, a fantastic evening. I certainly enjoyed uh, the energy of the event and uh, the, uh, the many, many uh, celebrations that took place as a result of the uh, iTech Awards at the end of uh, the evening. Uh, although it wasn't the end, was it? Because it went on quite a bit after that. Um, so, good morning. Um, my task first thing this morning as your conference chair is to offer some reflections on uh, our program from yesterday and some of the things that we heard. So, um, assuming the slide deck moves on, I will start to do that. Uh, there we go. That's what I was going to start with. Um, so one of the things that was said several times in different ways during the course of yesterday, which I think is worth just repeating today, uh, many things provoked, uh, I think, a lot of deep thought from yesterday. One of which was, you know, we're, this is a, an exciting market to be in. This is a market where we're beginning to map out some really significant opportunities to be part of the transformation that needs to happen to our health and social care system, to make a difference uh, for the quality of life uh, of the people that we're there to try and provide a service to. Um, but again, one of the points that was made, I think, very powerfully by Rafa Ben Goa and by other speakers yesterday, was that this is also a challenging uh, context in which to be working and for us as an industry we need to be thinking all the way about the how we how we present our offer to uh, local authorities to social services to the NHS um, and in terms of our event yesterday we uh, kicked off obviously with the call to action the publication of our partnership for pro uh, pros uh, prospectus for partnership with uh, uh, really setting out there the agenda for action that the TSA is uh, going to be taking forward and really the opportunities the tech sector has to contribute to population health, uh, particularly the role that data uh, can play in that, the role that uh, we need to play in helping to change uh, the workforce that we have today and make it more uh, attuned to the opportunities that technology and the use of population health approach can provide and that critically the way to do all of those things is through partnership working um, and uh, making sure that we for example look at the options that we have through procurement to uh, develop notions around risk sharing risk and reward uh, and and also making sure that in the dialogue we're having with uh, public sector partners that we are not offering uh, the kit and the solution before we properly understand and have cajoled and encouraged the public sector, sector partner to set out precisely what the problem is they are wanting us to help them work on and come up with a solution to. So I think that uh, was a, a powerful set of points that were made during the course of yesterday. We also talked about the context and opportunity of uh, public policy um, and although there is a lot of uncertainty about public policy in many areas and a desire to see some progress on social care as being a particular uh, thorn in the side, we nonetheless have uh, an industrial strategy which provides a focus around healthy ageing uh, and some specific opportunities around the uh, Grand Challenge Fund that's currently live and the opportunities for we as a sector to be involved in uh, bidding for some of the resources to drive the sort of changes that we would like to see. And of course the long-term plan, which was a, a thread I think that ran throughout a lot of the presentations we heard yesterday, and I think particularly when we got the international perspective from Rafa Bengoa, looking at uh, what he knows from the Spanish context, what he's seen in France, and particularly the work that he's been doing in the Nordics, um, that recognition that uh, this, is, this journey towards greater integration uh, of systems across health, housing, social care and beyond, working with community and voluntary sector and, and so on, uh, around a population health agenda is not a unique thing to the United Kingdom. It is a global trend that healthcare systems are pursuing um, and it was encouraging, I thought, to hear Rafa tell us that uh, he thought that the UK and particularly England with its integrated care systems might now be in a position both to accelerate its pace on that journey but also is now uh, in, a, in a strong place relative to many other systems around the world. Um, and then one of the things that came up again in a number of the stories and examples that we received during the course of the day was the importance of context, that context is king in understanding uh, how the solutions that this, in, this sector has uh, play to addressing, issue, addressing uh, the challenges that local authorities and others have. Um, and 
really that power of stories came across right at the beginning of the day with the uh, presentation by Mike Bradbury. Uh, from uh, Home Instead, talking about his journey from being a, a wood joiner to becoming a carer and effectively uh, the way in which he uh, had had his life changed by that caring role. And I thought he was a great uh, advert for what truly great care uh, and the building of personal relationships in that care can be about. Uh, and I think we need to see many more uh, like him. And it uh, spoke very powerfully as to why we have to do more as a sector to talk up the value of that hands-on care and see it as and portray it as uh, the career opportunity uh, and rewarding career opportunity that it can be. And then we had a challenge from Helen White in her presentation in the afternoon, really about how we look beneath uh, the surface of issues. And she gave the example of a woman who was the victim of domestic violence. Uh, and as a consequence of that, her sons were taking the front door off its hinges so that she could escape her husband uh, when necessary. Um, but the removal of that door upset the housing authorities and they were keen to evict her because of it. Uh, they hadn't asked the question why she was doing it in the first place. They'd not thought to understand her context. Uh, and that really led me, uh, whilst I was listening to Helen, to think of a, another example from uh, some work that uh, I'm aware of uh, in Hertfordshire and West Essex, which uh, is symbolised by this, uh, this photo. Uh, and it uh, comes uh, from a, a story that I was told about... Uh, an elderly gentleman who had been in and out of hospital on a number of occasions uh, because of an irregular heartbeat, uh, and uh, he'd also been in and out, in and out of it with his GP discussing uh, the problem, be giving lots and lots of medication to try and treat it, but no one really quite understanding why uh, he was experiencing this irregular heartbeat. Um, anyway, the GP thought they would try something different, and uh, they invited uh, one of the recently appointed uh, community navigators to go and visit uh, this gentleman uh, and his wife uh, and uh, she went in to have a cup of tea and a conversation, uh, several conversations in fact, to really just try and piece together um, what mattered to this gentleman and what was on his mind. And during one of these chats she noticed that both he and his wife were sitting on dining chairs uh, in the living room. Uh, and she couldn't quite understand why, you know, because there was a perfectly good sofa uh, in the room. Uh, so she started sort of asking a question or two about that. And what came to light was that for the gentleman and for his wife, the sofa they had had throughout their life was now too low for them to get in and out of easily. And yet what the gentleman said to her in this conversation was one of the things he missed most was sitting in front of the television on his sofa holding his wife's hand. But he no longer could do that because he could no longer sit on the sofa because he couldn't get out of it. Now, whether that was absolutely the trigger for the anxiety which led to the irregular heartbeat, we we'll never know. But it did result in a different sofa and it did result in him attending A&E and the GP far less often. So that social cause was ailing him in a way that maybe had manifested itself as a physical health problem. Which is why understanding the who, how, what and where, getting under the surface, has to be part of the sort of approach that this sector has to be advocating with its partners uh, if we're to make the progress and make the difference in people's lives. We also heard from Jeremy Hughes, the uh, Chief Executive of the Alzheimer's Society, and I thought it was a really great presentation absolutely fitted in with uh, the, the theme of the day and illustrated how care is changing um, by the way in which technology can be deployed. And he uh, highlighted some of the work that the Alzheimer's Society has been doing and he shared with us a glimpse of the emerging objectives for the dementia technology strategy. We have real partners and real fellow travellers when it comes to the opportunities that others see in technology and how it can be used. And indeed, the £100,000 fund that they have established was an incredibly exciting opportunity, which I hope many of us can be taking uh, advantage of. And then we also heard very much a theme from our, uh, uh, our call to action, that we need to make sure there's a strong thread running all through what we do uh, is this offer around training uh, and ongoing professional development, and that we need organisations that have that learning culture to really fully flex and uh, make the best use of uh, the available technologies and to make the very best use of staff. 
And then we had, a, I think, a very important message from uh, Martin Jones from Home Instead about, yes, we do want, as a sector, to be uh, high-tech, but we should never, ever lose sight of the fact that this is a people business, that we should never, ever lose sight of the fact that that human voice, human touch, is at the heart of this. That technology is not a substitute. It is alongside. It is about increasing uh, productivity, insight, and uh, being able to be more proactive in the way in which we are, operate. And he also, I think, made a really important point about what we measure. And again, this has come out quite a lot in the leadership events that we at TSA held early this year, that very often the things we count most are about measuring process and transactions rather than focusing most on the outcomes that matter to people. So measure what you value, not just what's easy to measure. And indeed, I would go further and underscore something that Helen White said to us yesterday, carry on measuring the inconvenient because there are plenty of inconvenient, inconvenient truths uh, to be measured, not least some of the health gaps that exist and health inequalities that exist uh, in our country. And perhaps unsurprisingly, um, a warning not to overclaim that there are no magic bullets. And again, Rafa Beno, uh, Beno was very clear about this, along with others in his contribution. And making a point, I think, really powerfully about actually in terms of the transformation we need to see to move towards a population health approach, that we have to be reconciled to the fact that we will have in-course corrections and that that's okay, and that we do need to be willing to learn from failure. All too often we celebrate success but never actually extract the full value of learning from when things didn't quite turn out how we expected. And I thought a point that really underscored this was the point that Helen made yesterday, which is that we have a health and social care system that was designed and was fit for purpose in the 1940s, and which has evolved and adapted ever since, but is still fundamentally stuck in a treatment model that is very much about dealing with the diseases and injuries and issues of the 1950s, 60s and 70s, and not the issues of long-term conditions and self-care that we need today. So... That's why a message that we have consistently banged the drum for as an organisation is the contribution that technology can play in slowing the progression of need. And I thought last night our compare at the gala dinner actually very well summed it up by saying that one of the things that we are able to sell is freedom. That ability for people to continue to have a life, not just experience a service, and also that peace of mind that can come with that. And I thought just I'd end with, um, again, a point that Helen made, um, which is that we perhaps all need to be more pirate uh, when it comes to the way in which we uh, act and engage, that there are small changes we can make in our own organisations and make for those that we serve that make really big differences in people's lives, that we, in a way, have a choice to make. Do we want to be the disruptors or do we want to be disrupted? And if we are disrupted those that replace us may have a very different agenda to the one that we have. So those were some of the thoughts and reflections I had from day one. We now have a really exciting and fully packed day two ahead of us.